Amen. All right, so here we need to, in order to start with chapter 28, we need to jump back a, just a little bit to read the last verses because it's really a continuation from chapter 27. Because we see in chapter 28 that Isaac is sending Jacob off. But in order to understand why, we've got to remember from last week. If you look at, um, you know, at the end, last week we preached on, the, the whole chapter was about, you know, Jacob coming in with guile and stealing the, the blessing from Esau, right? And at the end of the chapter, you know, Esau's really angry, he's really upset. And he's vowing to kill Jacob. Esau wants Jacob dead. So obviously, you know, his mother is privy to this. She, she finds out that he wants to kill him. And obviously she doesn't want him dead. So her, she's planning, okay, well, I'm just going to send him away, right? So that, so that he doesn't, uh, so he doesn't kill him. So look at verse 43. Um, or in verse 42, let's read the, the end of this here. It says, And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau is touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days, until thy brother's fury turn away, until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him. Then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? And she says both in one day because he was waiting. His plan was to wait for Isaac to die. Since he was just giving his blessing, Isaac doesn't know how long he's going to live. He's blessing him right before he dies. So he's saying, well, as soon as Isaac dies, I'm going to kill him. Right? So Rebecca's saying, well, I don't, I don't need to lose both of you in one day. So why don't you go unto Laban, unto, unto her brother. She's like, go to my brother's place you know, and stay there for a little while until, until his fury passes, until he, until he chills out a little bit. And then in verse 46, the Bible reads, And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? So she's kind of now pushing Isaac to get, to, to get Jacob to be sent off. And she's doing it by saying, well, look, you know, because Esau already has married two wives of the daughters of Canaan. And earlier in, in Genesis, we saw that, um, that this is displeased his parents. You know, they were, Isaac and Rebekah were both displeased that he had married the women of the Canaanites. Because they were heathen women. And they're going to, you know, as, we, as I preached earlier, they're going to they're gonna turn, you know, your heart away from the Lord. And, and that's what the heathen women will do. And I preached an entire sermon on that, or most of the sermon on that. But um, so she's saying, okay, well, Jacob hasn't married yet. And I don't want him marrying one of these heathen Canaanite women. So, you know, can, you know let's send him off so that he can marry just like, just like Isaac did, right? Abraham had his servant go and fetch a wife for him from his family, you know, from, from his lineage, from his family. And... Now, um, so Isaac did that, and now he's, you know, Rebecca's trying to get Isaac to send off Jacob to basically do the same thing. So that's where we, where we run into chapter 28, because she had just said that, you know, well, what good is my life going to do me if he marries one of these Canaanite women? So verse 1 of chapter 28 says, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. So she's, she's giving him charge. He's saying, look, I don't want you marrying one of these Canaanite women. Verse 2, Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away Jacob and he went to Padan Aram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's mother. So it's kind of interesting here because we still see, you know, Isaac listens to Rebekah and, and he still gives Jacob a blessing. He gives him a further blessing. He knew what happened, you know, from the last chapter. He, he realized when Esau came in what had happened. 
but you know he doesn't he's not holding a grudge against Jacob he's still blessed because at this point he's already blessed him right and it's not like he doesn't love his, his son Jacob either it's just that was the blessing he was intending to give to Esau. He ended up giving it to Jacob. So, you know, he blesses him further. And he's basically saying, okay, well, the blessings that, that have come on me, you know, from Abraham and, and have come unto me, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm praying that God's going to bless you, that you are going to be the son, you're going to be the child where these blessings fall upon. You're inheriting these blessings because God had promised the, you know, Abraham's progenitors right? And that in, in, in thee shall all the world be blessed, which is, we've, and again, I've, I've gone over this previously as well, when we look at Galatians chapter 3, when we look at, um, you know, these other scriptures, the Ephesians, and we see that um, that blessing is talking about Christ. That talk, it's talking about, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. It's talking about because Jesus Christ of the lineage of, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was going to come forth and he was going to bring salvation and he was going to be the one that's going to, you know, all the nations of the earth are blessed through Jesus Christ, through that seed. So he blesses him and he sends him on his way. And um, we see here that Esau, here's what happens in verse number six. It says, when Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to pay an Aram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to pay an Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac, his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. So we see I, I, Esau does something kind of foolish here. He's, he sees what's happening. He hears the charge. He's like, okay, well, you know, dad doesn't want Jacob marrying these Canaanite women, but he's already married to two. He already took two wives. So he's already done that. And now he's looking at this and saying, oh, well, you know, dad doesn't like the Canaanite women. And he sees that Jacob obeys his father, his mother. He listens to him and he goes off to do that. And then he sees, you know, he understands, well, you know, the, the daughters of Canaan don't please dad. So he's looking to like, I don't know, I think do what's right in his dad's eyes. But the way he does it is really foolish. Now, God did not intend for us to have multiple wives. That's not God's plan. The Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. The, the time you leave home is when you go to be with your wife, not to take multiple wives and you're not leaving home again and again and again and cleaving up onto multiple wives. God's plan was for one man and one, one woman to get married together and to start their own family. And that was God's design. Now, Esau didn't do that. He took two wives to him, and they were of the women of the Canaanites. But what I think it is obvious here with Esau is just a total lack of understanding of, of why they're even doing this. It's like, oh, well, they don't like the land, you know, the, the women of the land of Canaan. So he goes and marries one of Ishmael. So, so he's thinking, okay, well, Abraham, you know, had a child, and, you know, through one of Ishmael's daughters, you know, through, through that son, then I'm going to find a wife to try to please my dad. Because it's, it's, he's going back, you know, through the lineage. But it's not like he has to travel very far to find one. But he, he doesn't get it at all. He doesn't understand the importance. He doesn't understand where this is coming from. When he sends them away to, uh, to get a, a wife from Laban, from Rebekah's brother, because that's the same place, you know, onto Haran. That's where Abraham was from. That's where, where they were sent to find wives from. But he's like, well, I'm going to go. I'll just take a, a child or take a wife, excuse me, from Ishmael's children. And maybe dad will be pleased with that. And to me, it's just, it's just kind, of a, kind of a silly thing for him to do. I don't see how he thinks that's going to please his father. But, um, you know, instead of trying to understand why and, and to get it right, 
he just he just sees this. Oh well, he doesn't like the Canaanite women, so I'm gonna go get a wife here, and maybe Dad will please, be pleased with me. Without thinking, you know, well, what's right, and and why is that wrong, and and what should I really be doing? That's right. He just kind of acts on something ignorantly, and um, you know, it's it's similar to the pattern of Esau's life. Anyways, he does a lot of foolish things. He acts kind of hasty, and he, and he makes really poor choices, and that's kind of been indicative of his life. We saw when he sold his birthright, and um, you know, just really not, not having respect unto that, not, not caring as much about what's the right thing to do, and just acting on his impulses. And that's what he does here by going and getting a wife of um, one of Ishmael's children, of, of, of a daughter. And um, let's keep reading here, excuse me. Verse number 10, And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place. I don't know if you can imagine putting stones down and that's going to be your pillows, right? It doesn't sound very comfortable to me. But that's what he did. You know, he's traveling on his way to get a wife. So it says here, he, he took some of the stones and he wasn't didn't want to lay on the, on the wet ground. And he put his body on his pillows and he lay down in the place, in that place to sleep. And in verse 12 it says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So here we see God, the Lord, is actually giving him this blessing. This is after Isaac had sent him out, and Isaac had said, you know, the blessing of Abraham fall on thee. So God actually appears to Jacob in a vision. He dreams this dream, and he sees this ladder, and there's a ladder from the earth going all the way up into heaven. And he sees angels going up and coming down. It's just going up this ladder, coming down. And at the top of the ladder is God, is the Lord. And this is where the Lord gives him this same blessing that he blessed Abraham with and that he blessed Isaac with. Now it's com coming on to Jacob. Keep your finger in Genesis 28. I want you to turn to John chapter 1 because there's some interesting wording here. Genesis 28, 12 says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it, on this ladder. Right? What's the ladder? It's a, it's a way into heaven. Now, this is, you know, this is commonly referred to as Jacob's Ladder. And there's a lot of songs and things that have been written about Jacob's Ladder. And the one that comes to mind for me is this song that, that was put out in the 80s by, um, by Huey Lewis in the news. And they sang this song. And you know, this, song, this sermon is going to be about, about music, but you need to watch out for the worldly music because even the things that, you know, Huey Lewis in the news was just this kind of poppy, you know, a lot of people, the world probably think, oh, it's, it's, it's innocent, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Oh, it's just fun you know, poppy type music, no big deal. But actually, this song is a wicked song. The, the lyrics of the song, if I can remember, I, unfortunately, I have a lot of music just burned into my brain from, from years and years and years of listening to stuff. And I have way too much wicked music burned in my brain. But basically, in this song, he's like, he's mocking a soul winner. And, and the song's about Jacob's letter, and it's about works-based salvation. In the song, it goes... Um, he met a, met a fan dancer and uh, she was running from a fat man selling salvation in his hand is, what, is the way it goes. And he says, now he's trying to save me, but I'm doing all right the best that I can. And basically the song's going, you know, step by step, one by one. He's, he's just working his way and just, just every day trying to do better than before. Just, just trying to work his way up that ladder, trying to work his way up. And you know what? He's going to go to hell. 
because he's trusting in that works-based salvation. That song, I mean, he's mocking, oh, this fat man selling salvation. He's mocking someone going out and trying to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you, know, you can say, oh, that's a harmless song. No, it's not, because it influences you. It influences the way you think. You may not think that it does. You may never have even thought about those lyrics before. You've heard the song over and over and over again, and it gets into your subconscious, and it gets into your way of thinking, and it could really ruin the way that you think about things. This, is, this music is very subtle, and music is used as a vehicle to drive things into your brain. Now, music can be good, and it can be good. I love music. There's nothing wrong with music in general, just as uh, as a thing of just music, you know, musical instruments and singing songs. Nothing wrong with that as long as they're godly songs, as long as they're songs, hymns, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Those are all great things. They're good, greatly to be praised, greatly to be used. But those all have a purpose too. And I've, I've explained this in previous sermons where, you know, God is using, he has the book of Psalms, a huge book of the Bible. Those are all songs. Those are all put to music. And the reason being is because it helps you to me remember things. It helps you to memorize. When you put things in music, that's why when you teach the kids the alphabet, what do you do? You put it to a tune. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, and that helps the child to remember that and retain that for, for long periods of time, if not forever, which is the reason, exact reason why today I still have so much worldly music. All of those words just memorizes, imprint in my brain. You try to memorize the Bible, it's difficult. But those songs, man, I mean, if I, if I wanted to, I could quote probably almost that entire song that I'm even talking about. I don't care to. I don't want to because it's not just about that song. I've given you the, the relevant points of that song. But look, it's about workspace salvation. And we need to be careful that you're not just saying, oh, this is just some harmless song. Oh, this is not that big of a deal. Because it's not true. And you know, oftentimes with the music, you don't even know who writes this music either. You might think, oh, there's nothing wrong with these guys. Who wrote that song? You know that song I'm talking about? That wasn't even written by Huey Lewis. They just performed it. They just sang it. They just turned it into a number one hit. That was actually written, I think, by like Bruce Hornsby or somebody. Okay, so like there's a lot of songwriters out there that they write music for other people. How wicked is that guy? I mean, he's the one that came up with these words. And these other guys are the one that's singing it. You got to watch out for that stuff, though. And that's, I know that's kind of a little bit of a rabbit's trail, but we're talking about Jacob's ladder, and that's one of the things that came to my mind because there's a lot of people that talk about this. And look, that is a workspace salvation, but here's why it's relevant. Look at John chapter 1 in verse number 50. Because that, that was the picture that he saw. He saw it's a ladder straight into heaven. Right? Look at John 1, verse number 50. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto, them, unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter, ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now that is very, very similar to the word, the, almost the exact wording that we just saw in Genesis 28. He says, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And what did he see? He says, you're going to see heaven opened, and you're going to see the angels in, uh, ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And what I gather out of that is that, you know, Jesus is our ladder to heaven. Jesus is our way. Jesus is the way that we can get in to that, into heaven is through him. He's being referenced here in a way that's, that's, that lines up almost perfectly with this ladder that reaches into heaven in Genesis 28. Jacob sees this vision, and symbolically, Jesus Christ is that ladder. He is our way into heaven. And it's funny how the world will take that and just say the exact opposite. And they'll say it's based on works. Oh, we got to just go one, one rung at a time. Just keep on trying to get better and trying to get better. No. Jesus Christ is that ladder. It's not your own works. The only way you can get into heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's keep reading here. So God blesses him. Verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place. 
This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Now, a lot of people these days will be like, well, wait a minute. You know, if this is the house of God, if this is God's house, why is he saying this is dreadful? Why is he afraid? And people today, the reason why is because people today don't have a proper fear of the Lord. Now, first of all, that word dreadful, when people use that word dreadful today, it's kind of changed its meaning slightly. And when people say the word dreadful, they'll, they'll kind of think like that's horrible. That's really bad, right? But that's not really what the word dreadful means. I mean, literally the word dread, to dread something is to fear something. It's, it's just great extreme fear. That's what dreadful is. Like, oh man, I'm really afraid of that. That is a dreadful thing. That's something that instills a lot of fear. And God should instill a lot of fear. You look at all the people throughout the Old Testament who actually ever came like face to face with God or that were in God's presence, every single one of them falls flat down on their face like they're dead and is just shaking and trembling and quivering at, in the presence of the Lord because of His almighty power, because of who He is. Now look, should we let, you know, people say, oh yeah, but you know, perfect love casteth out fear. Yeah, perfect love does do that, but do you have perfect love? No, I don't. We ought to always have that fear. Now look, the goal would be, yes, to have that perfect love. And the reason why that verse in the Bible, perfect love casts without fear, is because if you are doing absolutely everything right, you don't have a reason to fear at all. Right? I mean, it makes sense. But the thing is, God chastens every son whom he receiveth. Right? God scourges every son whom he receiveth. He chastens his children. And if you're born again, you're a child of God. And look, we're not perfect. We sin which is all the more reason to have a fear of God. And it's a, you know, it's a similar type of fear that my children ought to have, for, you know, any child should have for their father. Because if you know, dad catches you messing around and screwing up and disobeying, well, you're going to get disciplined because your father loves you. It's going to come, but they need, they need to, to be in, in remembrance of that and fear of that. And too many people these days are treating God with such disrespect as if he's just their buddy. Right? And that's and see, this is the difference. God's not our buddy. He's our father. And I'm sick of the parents these days with all the divorce and everything else. You know, parents these days are trying to befriend their children instead of being their parents. Instead of telling them no, instead of disciplining them because they're fearful that, oh, well, if I spank them, then they're going to want to go with the other spouse. They're going to want to go back to mom. They're going to want to go back to dad. They're not going to want to be here with me because I discipline them with these divorced families. So they have this, this, this twisted idea in their head that, well, I'm going to give them gifts and we're going to hang out and we're going to be buddy-buddy and we're going to talk and all this other stuff. That you know, Look, there's nothing wrong with talking with your child, but they're talking about in a way where they're just friends. Listen now, you are not your child's friend. You are their parent. You, need, you have a different role. They could have all kinds of friends. And they're their friends. You're their parent, which is a way more important job for your child than a friend. With the proper parenting, I mean, really, a child doesn't have to have any friends. But they still need a parent. They need to be brought up right. And you can have a child that has all the friends in the world, and if they don't have a good parent, they're going to turn out wrong. They don't need another friend. They need a mother, and they need a father. Amen. And people these days, they don't treat God as if he's their father. They'll go to God as if he's just a friend because it's just become so relaxed. And people just start calling, oh yeah, JC and the man upstairs and all this other, you know, all this jargon and all these disrespectful titles and nicknames for God, for the holy God that created everything, the all-powerful God that Jacob said, how dreadful is this place? He was afraid. He's like, wow. He's like, whoa, this is God's house. How dreadful. I do not want to, I don't want to, you know, kick dust in the wrong place. If I'm in God's house, I need to make sure that I'm doing everything right. You know, I mean, you think about like, what do you think would go through your mind if, if all of a sudden you were by yourself, you're out on this journey and you just, you know, like God is like speaking to you. Now you're in this place like this is God's house. And you have this vision and God's talking to you. I'd be worried, like, thinking, probably thinking of, like, all the things I've done wrong, right? That would probably be, like, the first thing that's be, like, boom, like, 
Whoa. Because we live our lives in such a way that you think you get away with your sins sometimes. You do wrong and you think, oh yeah, okay, well, I just did wrong, whatever. You know, and the more you do, the more you just kind of excuse it away. But that moment when you're just confronted, it's like, well, hold on a second now. You know, and then all of a sudden you wish you hadn't done all those things. But at the time, you're just thinking, hey, yeah, no big deal. Okay, yeah, well, so what? I screwed up. Yeah, well, we're all sinners, whatever. And it's this flippant attitude towards sin, towards the way we live, towards the decisions that we make, the things that we do. And it, when you're actually confronted with God, it's a whole other story. You'd be flat on your face, you know, crying out to God, I'm sorry. You know, and that's what people are going to be doing on Judgment Day. But when they're, if you're not saved, they're going to be, God's going to be like, see you, you had your chance. But he says, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. Verse 18, and Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. Now, jump down real quick to verse number 22 because I want to, point all this out. We're going to put this all together here because he says this place is the house of God. He sets up a pillar and then verse 22, and this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Turn if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Keep your finger in Genesis 28. Of course, we're coming back. Look if you would to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 15 of 1 Timothy chapter 3 reads, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Look at this, the pillar and ground of the truth. So in the Old Testament there, we saw Jacob, he sets up a pillar. He says, this is the house of God. And he, and he, and he establishes this pillar. In the New Testament, we say, the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of the truth. The church is the house of God. And another thing, you know, how dreadful is this place? If this is the house of God, you know, one of the things I think that, that ought to be going on is this shouldn't just be some fun center. Right? People ought to be able to come in and hear about sins and God's laws and what God expects of your life in one way to, to put a little bit of dread in you, put a little bit of fear of God in your life and say, look, I'm not doing what's right. I need to do what's right. And it's not here just to give you a pat on the back and just tell you, hey, everything's great. Hell's cold. Sin's not that bad. Keep it up. That's what churches have come into. But no, Jacob said, man, how dreadful. Is this? this is the house of God. Now, another thing, when you think it's dreadful, it's a place that, that needs that respect. It's a, it's a place that you ought to come to with respect. Hey, look, church is important. The Bible says that this is the pillar and ground of the truth. You want to know what the truth is, you need to get your butt in church. So many people that you talk to them out at the doors, they'll say, you know, you ask them, hey, do you go to church anywhere? Well, I have my church right here. And they're not talking about like we're doing right now in this house where we're having a church, you know, we're having the congregation together. They're not talking about this. They're not talking about a church with a pastor and singing and everything else. No, they're basically saying, I don't go to church and I'm just going to come up with any excuse that, that pops into my head. Oh, I, I don't need church. Church is right here. Because they use that verse, oh, we're two or three to gather together in my name. There am I. Look, it says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. It doesn't say, oh, and by the way, that's church. Now, I'm sick of these people who think that I don't need to go to church. Or people say, that's not that important. And um, how can you say it's not that important when the Bible says it's a pillar in the ground of the truth? This is the church of the living ground. This is a place that's established for, you know, spreading the gospel. And it's a place where you go to hear a preacher and for a preacher to send you out. You need that, you know, God laid out a lot of, a lot of things. And in 1 Timothy 3 and in many other places we see, I'm going to turn there real quick. I just had that in my notes. But 
He gives all of these qualifications earlier on in that chapter. He says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. You know, why would he go through the effort of telling you, okay, look, if you're going to have a bishop, he needs to have this qualification. He needs to be apt to teach. He needs to not be given to wine. He needs to be not greedy of filthy lucre. You, know, you have to have all these qualifications to be a husband of one wife. And then the deacons. The deacons have this. And he's, he's establishing these orders, these offices for people to teach in the church. And you're going to say, oh, yeah, well, we have our church in the house. Okay, well, where's the bishop? Where's the bishop of your church, sir? Were you saying, well, we just have church here? How about the singing? How about the elders? Where are all the offices that the Bible is describing here? Where is that in your church? It's because you're not having church. It's because you're just trying to make up an excuse for why you don't go to church and you try to think, oh, well, Jesus is in my heart. We don't need that. Yes, you do need that. It's the pillar and ground of the truth. And that's why he says in verse 15 too, he says, you know, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. People need to learn how to behave themselves in church, in the house of God. This isn't just, you know, just come in and be all sloppy and just be eating food and drinking and just kick your feet up and just, you know, treat it like it's a movie or something, or you're just being entertained. That's not what church is about either. We need to be showing the proper respect for God. If you're going to come in here and say, oh yeah, but this is just your living room, your house. Look, this is the house of God. This is a church. Right now, when we're sitting together, we're congregating together, we're in the house of God. We're in the church of the living God. You could say the same thing. Oh, well, well what about Jacob? He said it was the house of God. He was just out in the open somewhere. It was just some land. But that was the house of God. Because God was there. And when we're congregated together, this is our church. We have born-again believers. We have a place established. We have a time established where we could congregate together. This is our church. This is the house of God. This is the pillar and ground of the truth. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Just right past the books of 1 and 2 Timothy, you'll find Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. Don't ever let this mindset come over you. Like, well, church isn't that big of a deal. Ah, let's just skip church today. Church isn't that big of a deal. It's not that important. Hebrews 10, verse 23 reads, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We see the day approaching. We can see the wickedness. We can see the, 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 the vilest of men being exalted in our country. We can see all of the signs coming together that's gonna, that has to happen before Christ returns. We can see it happening. We can see the day of Christ approaching. We need church so much the more. Why? Because we consider one another and to provoke unto love and to good works. Look, you need the people in this church and they need you. Don't just think, well, I'm real solid, I'm strong, I'm unwavering in my faith. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Other people need that too. They need you encouraging them and helping them. And you know, when you're gone, when you're gone from this church, you are missed. Everybody that's not here, when they're here, I'm always thinking about it, worried about them because they are an important part of this church and everybody needs church. And I'll tell you what, the more you get used to getting out of church, the more you start making excuses for it, the more it's going to happen. People need to have established, this is why I'm going to church. And look, you'll see it. The longer you're in church, you're in church, the longer, you, the more you'll see it. You'll have people that'll come, they'll be faithful for a while, and maybe they only come Sunday morning only, and they come, and they come, and they come, and then something happens. Something big, you know, something very excusable. You say, okay, well, yeah, of course. You know, they get sick or whatever, and they're out of church. And then maybe something else happens. But then you start to realize they're coming a lot less often. And maybe they got used to not coming to church so much. And now it's just, well, it's not as big of a deal. And it's not as important to them. Look, church is important. And, and the, the habits that you establish are very important as well. That's why I, a long time ago when I understood 
how important church was. I mean, you think about it. If it's real to you, if you really believe that church, the church of the living God is the pillar and ground of the truth, I mean, if you love the truth, if you want to know what the truth is, you're going to make sure that you're in church. It is that important. I cannot downplay how important church is. It is extremely important for your life for you to be continue to do the right thing and to live for God. You get out of church, you're going to get out of soul winning. You get out of soul winning, you're going to get out of doing anything for God, and you're going to get into the world because you're going to have this time. What are you going to fill it with? Well, if you're not filling it with the things of God, you're going to be filling it with the things of this world, and your life is going to become meaningless and vain and miserable. Because with the sin, with the worldliness, is going to come an emptiness and just unhappiness. And you may not even realize why that is. Because you've strayed far away and you don't even get it. Just like the prodigal son, right? He was a son of his father. He was saved, but he went off. He went off and thought he partied it up. He went and just left his father's house. The house of his father, he's gone way far away from him. And it didn't take until finally one day he woke up with the pigs and just wishing he could eat the pig's slop. And then it's just like, what am I doing? How did I get all the way down to this point? When he left, he never thought he'd be in that position. But when you get out, you get, he got out of his father's house. You get out of church, you get out of the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth, you're going to be hearing a bunch of lies. And it's going to impact you. Church is extremely important. We need to gather together around like-minded believers. It is critical for our lives to be hearing the truth and to be encouraging one another and receiving encouragement. To have other people think about you. And, you know, before I forget, Brother Wayne said tonight, he said, well, give everybody my regards. He calls, he calls when he's not going to make it. Now, look, there are people in our church that have very legitimate reasons for not coming and not being able to make it. And it's really a shame. It's too bad. But that's why we need to be praying for them. And, I, and you know, I don't always tell you guys this because I'm dealing with people a lot more probably than everyone else is. But he's thinking about you and he's worried about us. And, you know, people get out of this church and we're still thinking about it. We were talking about one today. But how much more would we be thinking about those people if they were actually still coming? You know, they're not in my thoughts all the time. They're not in my prayers all the time because they're gone. They started getting out. And look, prayer works. Church works. Edification works. We need to have more people. We need to, we need to have this to be an important part of your life, uh, the, the house of God, coming to church and receiving the edification. Not only is it good for edification, but I mean, the Bible saying not to do it. You say, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Make sure that you're getting into church. Now, there's a lot of people that, that you know, this, this house church movement, there's a whole movement of, of people who think that like, you know, they... <laughs> They call the church buildings, names and stuff and say, oh, that's not scriptural. Because did people meet in houses back in the, you know, in the New Testament? Sure they did. We're meeting in a house right now, but it's not about the building. But they'll make it all about the building and say, well, no, you must meet in a house. And like, otherwise, you're not a good, you know, not a right church. Look, we're looking to grow. We're looking to expand. We're looking to, to fill our church because the church literally is a congregation with believers so that we can outgrow the, the physical space that we have here into a place where we can have more physical space and we can have more believers gathered together and have a bigger church. And that way we would have the need for elders and deacons for to have plural and not just one. Where you're meeting in a, in a small place, it's only so many people are going to be here. You don't have the necessity of, of, of requiring extra you know, elders, deacons, and, and so forth to administer the church and to, and to lead the church. You don't, you, there's no need for it. When you look in the book of Acts and you look at the needs that people were having, they're saying, look, it's not meat for us to go and serve tables. He's like, you know, the, the apostles were saying, we need to spend our, dedicate our time solely to the word and to preaching the gospel. He said, you know, let other people do this other work. Because it was the church's responsibility to look after the widows, to look after the fathers, to, to, to help support the widows that were widows indeed. That was part of the church's job. And, you know, the church had grown so much, the Greeks were saying, look, you know, they were upset, they were complaining and saying, no, no one's looking out for our widows. What's, you know, what's the deal here? 
And the apostles are like, look, we need to be dead. You know, this is the work we need to do. So let's appoint more people because they're all part of that church. That's where they appointed these, these deacons to do that job and to do that ministering unto other people within the church because the church was so big. Now, if the church was that big, they have all these widows and you have multiple elders that were not able to, to spend their time taking care of them. That's a pretty big church. That's, that's not a church meeting in somebody's house. I'll tell you that right now. You cannot tell me that they were meeting in someone's house where they had so many people meeting at that house that there were so many widows being neglected that the apostles could not handle that workload. And that they had to appoint like seven people to do that, to do all of that work. There were thousands added to the church. They were not meeting all in a house. Now, were small churches meeting in houses? Yes. As the, as the gospel continued to spread, especially out in the different areas, yes, of course, people were meeting in houses. That's how they got started. But were all the churches meeting in houses? No. Some of the churches were meeting in the old synagogues, the synagogues that were built. I mean, there was already a building established for a bunch of people to congregate together and there were a bunch of people that were saved. So, of course, that would only make sense. Now, um, I want to make another point here. Let's, let's go back to Genesis 28. It says in verse 19, it says, And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. Now, Bethel is the place where this was established, where he sets up this pillar, right? And he says, this is God's house. But if you, you know, if you know your Bible a little bit, later on, Bethel becomes one of the places where Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, when the kingdom of Israel was split, we had the king Saul, king David, king Solomon, right? And because Solomon, his heart turned away from serving God because his, his multiple wives, his heathen wives had put, turned his heart away from serving God. He was building these altars unto, unto false gods. Because of that sin, God divided the kingdom of Israel into two parts. And he left one part basically for, for David's lineage because David was such a righteous man. He's saying, okay, well, for David's sake, you know, you'll still have this. But the whole rest of it, he split up. And he said, you know, and then Rehoboam took over the kingdom. And then that's when it was split was, was in Rehoboam's day, days. And Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, was anointed king of Israel. He was anointed king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And the southern kingdom of Judah was the split. Jeroboam was that first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, which is the much bigger kingdom. And he was so worried that he was going to lose his power. He was going to lose, you know, basically being a king. He thought, man, you know, these people are going to keep going back to Jerusalem and worshiping God. And, you know, they're going to want to just go back and be under the rule of David's, of David's lineage. And they're going to kill me and then I won't be king anymore. So he said... In order to solve this problem, he set up these two golden calves, one in Dan and the other in Bethel. So this place, this is the very place where Jacob had the vision of God. And he said, this is God's house. And he set up this pillar. And this is the pillar and ground of the truth. This is God's house was defiled with King Jeroboam setting up his golden calf. And that was, that was there all the way until like the days of Josiah which is like one of the last kings before they were taken captive. And um, so why am I even bringing this up? Well, you know, this was the established pillar and ground of the truth, but over time they allowed this idolatry to creep in. They allowed the false doctrine. It, it, it ended up rearing its ugly head and it stayed in there and then it stayed for a long time. Now, I believe the same thing has happened in many churches throughout our country, that at one point they were great churches. I believe that there were many great churches in this land not that long ago. You know, maybe a hundred years ago. I don't know exactly how long ago, but, but just by the way that people's morals were, by, just by the way that the whole culture responded to God's Word and, God, and the Bible was so prevalent in the society, there had to have been good churches around to have that type of an atmosphere, to have that type of a culture, to have that type of godliness in general and morality. It was a godly culture. But what happened? The, the, idol, the idols were set up. The false doctrine got in and, were, and was let to run rampant. 
in these churches to the point to where these churches start to die and will lose their candles. Like if you turn to Revelation, Revelation 2 and 3 gives us warnings. Now these were in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, there were warnings, there was letters written out to these various churches at this time that existed when, when John was, was penning down the book of Revelation. And these letters were sent to all of these different churches. And the warning that comes up over and over again is saying, look, your light is going to be extinguished. Says, your, your place, your, candle, your candlestick, you're going to be removed from being, in God's eyes, a legitimate church. He's saying, God's going to remove your candlestick. You are no longer going to be a church. And what does a candle do? A candlestick, you know, it glows. It shines. It shines the light. And that's the church's job is to be shining its light in this dark world. And if you're not shining that light, God's saying, I'm going to remove your place. You are no longer even going to be considered a valid church in my eyes, which is what he said to, um, in Revelation chapter 2, look at verse number 5. He's talking to the, to the church at Ephesus and, he's, and you know, he starts off praising him saying, look, I know your works. I know all the stuff you've done. You've been doing good things for me. But he says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. And I believe the first works is the soul winning, going out and really shining that light of the gospel. He's saying, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. So when churches start to have these problems, when they start to have the idolatry set up, God will give a warning and say, okay, look, you need to get this stuff right, but if you don't get it right, you're removed. Your candlestick is gone. You're no longer going to be considered one of God's churches. And, I mean, their light just going to be extinguished anyways. And that's, where you, that's why there's so many churches, even Baptist churches that don't do any souling, don't do anything like that. Their light's been extinguished. They are not shining that light, the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Let's go back to Genesis chapter 28. This will be my last point. Genesis 28, verse number 20. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my Father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. So Jacob, you know, he, he makes his vow. He's saying, okay, well, look, if God's really going to be with me, if I, listen, if I listen to you, God, if I trust you, if you're going to keep me in my way and give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I'm able to come to my father's house in peace, like, then you, you, know, you will be my God. And you know, this is real similar. He talks about just bread to eat and raiment. I mean, he's talking about the basics. He's not asking... To, to be blessed with you know, all kinds of riches and everything else. He just says, look, if you keep me alive, you give me food, you give me clothing, and just lead my way, you are my God. And God says, you know, in 1 Timothy 6, 8, the Bible says, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Psalm 37, 25 says, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. God promises that we will have these things. In Matthew 6, it's probably the, the best way when Jesus Christ said it. He said in verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth, that ye have need of all these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I believe that Jacob was taking this step of faith, and he's saying, okay, God, I'm going to put faith in you. And, and all I ask is just keep me fed and keep me with clothing and lead me back here. Just lead my steps. And, and he stepped out in faith. And he's saying, and you're my God, because that's, that's it. And that's what God promises unto us. He's saying, look, O ye of little faith. He's like, don't worry about the food and the clothing. And Jacob ended up not worrying about it. He said, okay, I'm going to give this in your hands, God. God, just keep me fed, keep me clothed, and I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to go here, I'm going to listen to my parents, and I'm going to, you know, he, he, God had spoken to him in that vision, and he says, okay, God, I'm going to do what you have for me to do. So Jacob vows. Now, 
What he also does then in verse 22, and this, is, this was the last point. I forgot about the other point. This is, this is really, really, for real, is the last point. And uh, in Genesis 28, 22, he says, And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So here Jacob is vowing to give God a tithe. He's saying, everything that you give me, God, I'm going to give you back one-tenth. Now, this was another example that we see in the Bible of tithing that's not solely for the Levites because you have the people today that don't believe in tithing. They say, tithing's not scriptural. Tithing's not for the New Testament. And they say, tithing was only established for the Levites, and that's it, and it ended with the Levitical priesthood. Well, Abraham tithed. We already went over that. And now we see Jacob giving a tenth. And a tithe literally means a tenth. So we see Jacob here giving a tenth of his stuff. We see tithing. It's not just for the Levites. Amen. We see here that he's giving his, you know, a tenth. And, it's, and what is he giving? What you've given me, God. It's, a, it's the tenth of our increase. And that's what the tithe is. Is however much God has increased you and blessed you, you give back a tenth. And that tithe belongs unto God. Let's turn to, to Malachi chapter 3. Because it's, what's really interesting is that, I, I, you know, the way that these two main major points in this chapter about the pillar and ground, God's house, right? The pillar and ground of the truth and tithing are brought up in the same chapter because the same people that will tell you, oh no, you know, the right way is having a house church and that you shouldn't go to these buildings and where the pastor is paid because that was a, the pastor is paid. And they'll say he's a hireling and they'll, they'll use all these derogatory terms and try to tell you, oh yeah, that's unscriptural. That's un no, it's not. And we're going to see that. I'm going to prove that with just a couple of, of references. I'm not going to go fully in depth. I've done it before. But it's interesting how... Both of these things are tied together. The church in this chapter and Jacob giving a tithe. The pillar and ground of the truth and Jacob's tithe. Now, look what it says in verse 8 of Malachi chapter 3. The Bible reads, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings, ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So basically, God's saying, look, First of all, you're robbing God because a tithe really belongs unto God. Now, what he wants from you out of the tithe, it's not that God needs your money. Because God doesn't need your money. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God doesn't need the cash. Okay? But God, one of the things God wants is your obedience. God has commanded us. Now, look, the tithes did go to pay for the Levites to help them because they were dedicated unto the service of the Lord. They had their lands, but they weren't, lot, they weren't supposed to be going and, and you know, working their land and, and, and making their means that way. They needed to be provided for because they were continually dedicated to doing God's work. And we're going to see that if you turn to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, this hasn't changed. Now, the Levitical priesthood has changed. That doesn't exist anymore. But taking care of God's people, people still minister solely on the things of God and doing God's work. And those people still need to be taken care of and cared for so that they can attend completely unto doing God's work instead of having to worry about going out and making their, their means some other way and providing their food some other way for their families. Instead of folk, you know, splitting up their time, God wants them com continually committed to doing His work, which is why He, is set, why he didn't abolish, not that why He said, why He didn't abolish the tithe. It continues to this day. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 will show that. But see, a lot of people will, will have this problem and they'll say, well, look, you know, th times are really tight right now. I can't afford to pay the tithe because, man, I'm just struggling to make ends meet. I've got these bills. I've got this other stuff going on. Well, look, what we just read in Malachi chapter 3, 
He says, if you don't tithe, you're cursed with a curse. So I don't know about you, but I'm thinking that if, if I'm really struggling financially, the last thing I need is a curse upon me from God. If I'm thinking that I'm going to somehow, you know, save this money that I would have given to God that he's commanded me to do, I'm going to, I'm going to use this and then we'll, I'll, I'll be better as a result of that. You might want to think again because you are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me. He says you're robbing God. When you're not giving that money, you're robbing God. You're not saving money for yourself and helping pay your bills. You're actually robbing God. And he says, prove me. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. He says, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. He says, if you just listen to me, if you just give the tithes, yeah, sometimes it might take a little bit of faith, but if you just do this, he says, I'll bless you for it. I'll bless you. You're not, you're not even really sacrificing your money because God's going to bless you. He promises to bless you. He says he will make sure that this works, but he wants your obedience. Sometimes we don't see that and we think that like, you know, I don't see how this could possibly work out. You know, in our, in our fleshly mind, we start to do the math or we think about it and say, this can't work. God has a way. He says, look, I'll open up the heavens and pour out a blessing for you. Now, another reason why people think they can't afford it is because they've got wrong priorities on what is needful and what's not needful. I mean, these days, you know, you've got people saying, oh, I'm so poor, and they've got cable TV, cell phones, you know, all this crap, all this junk, right? All this money just being spent on things you don't need. You know what you need? You need food and you need clothing. You need a place to stay, right? Somewhere. But I mean, God promised food and clothing. He didn't even say he's going to promise you a house. He says you need food and clothing. That's what you need. <clears throat> but he says, look, prove me. Prove me wrong. He says, if you don't pay it, he says, you're going to get cursed. But if you do, it's a blessing. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, because I just want to show this. And look, don't, st don't sit there and think that like, oh, Pastor Burson, you're just preaching for the money. You just want the money. Look, if that's what you think, I mean, go ahead and keep thinking that. But why don't you judge if I'm preaching for money today based on the things that I preach out of the Bible? Because the Bible talks about people who preach for filthy lucre's sake. And you know what they do? They don't preach the whole counsel of God. You know what they do? They trim the message. They try to tell you things that you just want to hear. That's what the, the preacher that preaches for money does. That's what Joel Osteen does. That's why he never preaches on sins. If I wanted to just preach for money so that I can be financially increased because of people coming to church, I wouldn't be preaching on sins. I would trim the message. I'd just try to get a lot of bodies in here. And, and I mean, it would be a whole different scheme. It would just be a business and I'd be operating it just like a business that's designed to make money. If that was my goal. But you could judge for yourself. And by the way, I don't even receive any of the money that comes into this church. I will in the future, but I don't right now. That is, I do not do that. I pay a tithe to church too, by the way. Because it's right. Because it's the right thing to do. Because God commanded for it to be done. But just to show you that it has not been done away, it's actually still been established in the New Testament. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. You know, and, and be careful who you get your information from, especially when it comes to doctrine and when it comes to the internet. Because there's a lot of internet junkies out there. There's a lot of people who claim to be teachers of the word and they say, oh, I have this ministry and my ministry is making YouTube videos. And they talk about the Bible. And you, want, you, know, you come across these things and you hear it. And usually it's from someone who's not even qualified to be a pastor and someone who's just, just giving you their, their thoughts and their interpretation. And half the time they're not even saved. And they're telling you, oh, yeah, see, tithing's not scriptural. And they're going to say, yeah, well, what church do you go to? Well, uh, I, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I don't have a church. I... Yeah, that's what I thought. You're not getting the truth. You're coming up out of the own imagination of your heart. You're hearing some things and say, oh, yeah, yeah. No, I don't need to go to church because you want to justify why you're so lazy you can't make it into church. And, well, no church, so you, just, you, don't, you don't need to pay a tithe either. Because if you had to pay a tithe... You're not going to be able to pay a tithe sitting at home. You actually have to bring your tithe to the storehouse. You have to bring it to the house of God. You actually have to go to church if you're going to be tithing. So then they start saying, oh, well, you know, we don't need, you know, 
We don't, we don't need to pay tithes. The New Testament, God just wants us to have a bunch of little cells of, of people meeting in small houses and no one pays a tithe and, and you know, maybe they think no one's an established preacher or pastor, I don't know. But even if they think there is somebody, I guess it's just for a small group and they just keep breaking up into these other small groups and no one pays a tithe. Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's see what the Bible says about this. Verse number 9, For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Or saith he altogether, For our sakes, for our sakes no doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we, we talking about um, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas as referred to back in verse 6, or I only and Barnabas, have not we power to forbear working. He's saying, look, we have the power not to work. Because they were working. See, Paul and Barnabas, would, they would go and preach the gospel and work. They, they kept these jobs, so they were sustaining themselves because they were trying to be an example of people that worked very hard and that were self-sufficient and did ministering to people. And they were just trying to be a really good example of people. But he said, look, they've got the power to forbear working. They can stop doing their side job and just do what they were doing and living of the gospel. They had that right. They had that the ability, just like I have that right to do that. I'm choosing not to right now because I'm trying to, to put as much energy and effort into getting this church going and getting up off the ground and everything else. But look, he's saying, can we, don't we, you know, we could forbear working. But that's what he says here in verse 11. If we, talking about Paul and Barnabas, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Right? I mean, we're giving you the truth. We're giving you the gospel. We're feeding you with spiritual meat. Is it really that big of a deal? Is it really a big thing if we get some of your carnal things, some of your food, some of your, you know, so, some kind of support, just fleshly support so that we could can continue doing this? Is that really a big deal? Verse 12, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Now look, who is he talking about here when he says the things of the temple and those ministers of the holy things? He's talking about the, the Levites, right? I mean, he's talking about the Old Testament in the temple, the people that, that did the work of the temple. They lived of the things of the temple. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. So he's, he's, he's questioning them and saying, look, because that's the way things were done. You know, the, those, the Levites, those that worked at the temple, those that, that did that service of God, they partook of that because... When they offered the sacrifices, they would be the ones they had certain meat, they would have meat and things that would sustain them. Verse 14, even so, in the same way, in like manner that that was done with the Levites, with the temple, even so, verse 14, hath the Lord ordained, he's appointed it, that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. He's saying, look, God's ordained it in the New Testament. Now, how, how are you going to live of the gospel? Well, how did the priests live of the temple and, and partake of, the, of the, the holy things? Because of the people bringing in their tithes. That's how they survived. That's how they got by. In like manner, those that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In like manner, the tithes come into the church to support those that are, that are supposed to wholly be dedicated into doing these things. That is the purpose. Look, it has not been, and I don't preach about this very much, but it is an important subject, and I'm not afraid to say, I'm not afraid to preach against it. I don't care. If you think that I'm all about the money, then go ahead and keep thinking that way and stay at home and and ignore the warnings from Hebrews chapter 10. Ignore the warnings from the Bible admonishing you how important church is. And just, you know, and, and you know what? If you don't pay a tithe to the church, I don't care. Honestly, like I don't, it doesn't matter to me because that's between you and God. It does, it really, now I do care just for you and your own well-being. 
You know, when the, when the Bible talks about cursings versus blessings, I want everyone in this church to be blessed. I do, but ultimately, like, it doesn't hurt me any if, you know, if the money doesn't come in. That's fine. It doesn't matter. But it is something that the Bible teaches, and I'm going to preach it because it's in the Bible. And I think that just like any other sin, just like any other teaching in the Bible, it's there. We saw Jacob paid a tithe. Jacob knew the importance and the pillar and the ground of the truth. And it's all in the Bible. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I thank you for um, the book of Genesis and, and all the great truths that we learn in the Bible, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just bless everyone that's here today. Help us to continue to grow closer to you and to just continue to have the faith to do what's right, dear Lord. And um, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.